Hey guys, welcome into Commodity Culture. On this program, we seek to give an overview of the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Today, we're going to be doing a deep dive on one particular uranium company, and that is NextGen Energy. Before we get started, standard disclaimer, none of this is investing advice. Do your own due diligence, and I am a shareholder in NextGen Energy. NextGen Energy has a market cap of approximately $2.2 billion Canadian, trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, and recently has started trading on the Australian Stock Exchange as well. Please note all the figures I'm going to be using today are in Canadian dollars unless otherwise mentioned. NextGen is a uranium company in the development stage located in the Athabasca Basin in Saskatchewan, Canada. If you're unfamiliar with the Athabasca, it is basically called the Saudi Arabia of uranium because it contains some of the largest deposits and some of the highest grade deposits in the known world. If you compare your average grade of uranium found pretty much anywhere else in the world with the Athabasca, there is a massive difference. Um, as a result, there's a lot of uranium companies in the various stages from explorer development and then you've got of course Cameco operating there, one of the few companies that is producing uranium. When it comes to NextGen, there's really one thing to focus on and that is their aero deposit on their Rook 1 property. That is pretty much the greatest uranium deposit potentially ever discovered and it's going to be the focus of the conversation today and the reason why I am bullish on NextGen. So we're going to go over the reasons why I like NextGen and then we're also going to go over some things I don't like so much and maybe some things that could also go wrong in the future. So Rook1 has a planned production of 30 million pounds of uranium per year when the mine goes into full operation which could represent 15 to 20 percent of the total needs of the world of uranium, which is pretty amazing. The other thing about it uh, is that the all-in cost of production is among the cheapest in the world at about $5.60 per pound of uranium, that is in US dollars. The aero deposit is also basement hosted. Now I'm not a geologist, but this basically means that it's fairly near surface and so easier to get to and extract than a lot of the other uranium deposits both in the world and in the Athabasca Basin as well. So this contributes to the low cost of production. So now let's dive into the feasibility study. And this is obviously a very important document to analyze because it represents a fairly confident assessment of the economic potential of the aero deposit and the Rook 1 property. So the numbers in this feasibility study use a base case of $50 a pound uranium. I think a lot of us realize or believe that the price is going to go much higher than that. As of the recording of this video, we're hovering around $50 already, and the supply demand fundamentals, along with the fact that most companies need a much higher price than $50 to go into production, along with a whole bunch of other catalysts, means that some are estimating the price could go above $100. But let's take a look at this $50 per pound base case that NextGen has presented. Firstly, as I mentioned, incredibly low production costs at $5.69 a pound US dollars. That is pretty much unheard of and makes this deposit one of the lowest cost mines in the world for uranium and pretty much anything else. The after-tax net present value at an 8% discount rate is approximately $3.4 billion Canadian, and the internal rate of return after tax is 52%. Now, if you're unaware of what net present value and internal rate of return is, there's a lot of videos on YouTube that can explain it, but net present value is basically a discounted cash flow model that takes the estimated cash flows from the future and brings it back to the present, adjusting by a discount rate. Um, and then the internal rate of return, basically as a rule of thumb, anything above 20% is quite decent. Above 30%, you're looking at good. Above 40% is great. So to see an IRR above 50% here, with only $50 uranium as the base case is truly impressive. I think it's also important to look at the average annual net cash after tax, and that's approximately $1.03 billion per year. And again, this is based on $50 uranium, so let's dare to dream, because when we really look at it, the last bull cycle, uranium reached almost $150 a pound at its peak. A lot of people are speculating it could get there or above, because when you adjust for inflation, it's a number much higher than that. 
as we sit here in 2022 when inflation is raging. Um, but so let's look at some bigger numbers. When we look at uranium in the hundreds of dollars, it brings the after-tax NPV to between 8 and $12 billion, and the after-tax IRR between 80 and 100%, which is ludicrous. It's almost a too-good-to-be-true number, but that's apparently what it is. So if we're looking at uranium over $100, we're going to see unbelievably profitable operations from next-gen, extremely attractive numbers, um, which will make the mine probably one of the most profitable in the world. It should also be noted that all these figures are based on a 10.7 year mine life, uh, which is which it is currently approved for, but they are looking to extend that to 24 years. So that would obviously change all the figures and make the numbers more attractive because we'd be looking out a full 24 years. So some other things I like about Next Gen Energy is their 50.1% ownership of ISO Energy. This is a uranium exploration company located in the eastern Athabasca. They have 24 uh, assets, over 248,000 hectares, and they have intersected grades of uranium of U308 at above 70%. Uh, they obviously, that's a small portion of a much bigger picture, but those grades of U308 are completely unheard of. Uh, I've never heard of them before. I've heard potentially in the past in the Congo grades like that have been intersected, but there's not a lot of opportunity to mine uranium in a socially responsible way in that area. If you want to look more into ISO energy, you can feel free to do so, of course. I'm not going to dive deeper than I already have. But I do believe that 50.1% ownership of ISO, which was spun out of NextGen um, in the past to focus on exploration, is a great asset and contributes to the bull case for NextGen. NextGen also has a lot of exploration potential, both in on the Rook property and on some of their other properties as well. They do own other properties, of course. I just didn't really touch on them because for me, um, the the Aero deposit is really what is the strongest point of next gen and although they have a lot of other exploration potential to maybe even find some deposits similar to arrow that's speculation and we do not have any data that indicates that's going to be the case 100 percent i'm hopeful but i don't really calculate that in to why i invest in next gen next gen also at the time of this recording has approximately 170 million dollars in cash and a very low debt to equity ratio at 0.4, which is great. So some milestones that NextGen has achieved in recent times is, of course, the feasibility study itself, which was released, I believe, in March of 2021. So that kind of puts some very strong numbers that we can consider and have confidence in, particularly because a feasibility study when moving up from a pre-feasibility study goes from measured and indicated mine reserves to proven and probable, which when we're looking at probable, that's a 50% plus chance of uh, economic commercial extraction. And then when you get into proven resources, it's 90% plus. So what this basically means is you can have a very high degree of confidence in these numbers. Another thing that I think is a significant milestone is they signed an impact benefit agreement with the Clearwater River Dene Nation. It appears that there is a great deal of collaboration and cooperation between NextGen and the indigenous people in the area, which is extraordinarily important when you're looking at, you know, preserving the community, the environment, all of these things. I know NextGen is very active with a lot of social initiatives um, in the area, particularly with the Dene people. So that's great. I'm all for that. And you, of course, need all stakeholders involved to sign off on the project and hopefully benefit from it as well. So I think that's moving things in the right direction in that sense. There's also a draft environmental impact study, which has been submitted by NextGen June here in 2022. So that is currently being reviewed by all the relevant parties, including you know, organizations from the Canadian government that need to take a look at that. So that is definitely taking a step in the right direction. That's the result of years of testing um, and making sure that when the mine is constructed, it will have the most minimal environmental impact possible. Here are some things I don't like or some what could go wrongs. Um, 
when will this mine actually go into production? This is something that annoys me a little bit because NextGen never talks about that in their company presentation, on their website, in their interviews. It's, they never mention a timeline for going into production. They talk about what they've achieved in 2021. They talked about the goals for 2022, but <laughs> it's a little disheartening because when you look at other companies' presentation, let's take Denizen Mines, for example, they lay out an estimated timeline for when their mines plan to come into production. Um, but for next gen, that seems to be completely absent. You've got people out there who believe that it's going to be, you know, 2030 or later before they go into production. So depending on how long this upcoming uranium bull cycle lasts, some people are speculating that they might not go into production during this bull cycle. Although I do believe it's possible that in sharp contrast to the last bull run pre-Fukushima disaster, we could have a longer, more protracted, decade-long, or maybe even longer bull run in uranium and other commodities as well. So that's definitely a concern and something to keep an eye on to watch for when they hopefully come up with a more concrete timeline for when they plan to produce uranium. The other concern is this deposit and property is in the middle of nowhere and there is not a great deal of roads and infrastructure that is built. So it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of money. Obviously that's all I would assume calculated into the feasibility study, but that's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of work. So we're going to have to follow that situation as well because it is currently not so accessible. The next thing is the feasibility study. As great as it is and as great as all the numbers are, it was from March of 2021. It's over a year since this feasibility study has been released. One of my previous guests on this show, the great Lobo Tigre, has stated that in his opinion, any feasibility study that gets older than two years needs to be redone for a number of reasons. I mean, we're looking at rampant inflation right now, so the costs of putting this mine together could have even gone up quite drastically from the time the feasibility study was published until the time of this recording of the video. And if inflation continues, it could go even higher. Now, the numbers are so attractive that I don't think that's a huge issue. It's not going to massively affect the fact that this is going to be extremely profitable, but it is definitely something to keep an eye on. And let's hopefully wait and see for NextGen to put out another feasibility study, uh, maybe next year or the year after. The other thing is how long will this environmental impact study take to get approved? They've submitted a draft which is being reviewed. I'm not privy to how this whole process works, but I'm guessing the draft needs to go through, be approved, and then they need to go ahead and create a final version. Perhaps they're going to get input on some other things that, that needs to be included. So that could take some time as well. Bureaucracy in Canada um, does not move quickly, which is one of the issues with permitting a mine in Canada. It's interesting because when we look at jurisdictional risk, People look at Canada as a safe and stable place because there's no wars going on. The government isn't that corrupt yet, although I also have my concerns if we look forward and things keep heading in the direction that they are heading in that country, that we could see, you know, some, some darker times for the government in terms of their policies. But at the moment, still decent. But the bureaucracy, the time that it takes, is its own jurisdictional risk. So when we look at a country like Niger, where there's political instability sometimes, there's also war sometimes. We look at that as perhaps a dangerous jurisdiction to invest in, but mines will get permitted much faster. So it's kind of a you know double-edged sword in that sense. So we're going to have to watch, wait and see just how the permitting process goes moving forward and how long it's going to take for this mine to come into production. All right, guys, that's it from me. I hope you've enjoyed this breakdown of Next Gen Energy. Please do like and subscribe if you enjoy this content, and I'm going to continue this with a deep dive on another company next week on Friday. See you next time. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.